How many times have we messed up, got forgiven, messed up, got forgiven, messed up, got forgiven, but they mess up once or twice or 3,000 times against us, and oh, they're wrong, but we're right. Y'all hear anything I'm saying yet? We have to show the forgiveness that we want afforded to ourselves. Memory is a huge part of that. Let me just ask this question. Are your thoughts under control? Are your thoughts under control? What's the name of that movie where every time the woman went to sleep and she woke back up, she had no memory? Huh? Fifty first dates. And so the guy got wise, and so he, he recorded himself on a VCR tape, and so whenever she'd wake up, there was a sticker that said, hit play first. Your name is, you're located at, you're married to, your kids are, and I will be such and such and so and so. I think when we go to bed, we need to be willing to forget all of the things that are trying to cement themselves into our life. And we, we, when we wake up in the morning, we need to open up the book and go, I am, and he is, and we are. So that sets the tone for how we're going to process everything that occurs throughout that day. Does that make sense? How many has ever left a coffee mug or a milk mug with just a little bit of fluid at the bottom? You were just too lazy to go to the sink and wash it out. Come on. A lot of times milk is worse than the coffee, right? And so you catch it about 36 hours after it's been there and you thought, I don't feel like washing it, but I bet I can rinse that out. So you go to the sink and you turn on the tap, but you put it on the little, you know, not the little drippy thing, but the, you know, the, that kind of thing. And so you're shooting it in there. And you keep rinsing it, but it, there's half of it still stuck to the bottom. So you get a little irritated. So what do you do? You put it on the hottest water you got. You let the hot water get there. Then, psh, then you're swishing it around in there and dumping it. Psh, and swishing it around and dumping it. Why? To get rid of the thing that has cemented itself at the bottom of your cup or mug. Okay? This is what happens when we don't allow ourselves to forgive right after it came in the cup. We let it sit, and it sets up, and then it sticks. So when we get lazy, let's just say it's milk. You go, well, it's milk. It, milk can't hurt milk, so you pour fresh milk on top of the... Watch this. Because if you can't see it, and it's stuck to the bottom of the cup, you can't taste it, so it doesn't matter that it's there. Okay, let's go to coffee. So you got a little coffee in the bottom, and you think, well, coffee is coffee, so I'm going to put the fresh coffee in, and it's going to be hot enough that as it sits there, it's going to loosen it up. It's, it's all going to be one anyway. You, you catch what I'm saying? So we think that just by pouring more in, somehow it absolves what was already there until you take that last swig of the coffee and realize it's still there. Huh? This is what we do many times when we don't release what's trying to stick in our lives. So what is it we're supposed to remember? I'm going to hit this fast. What are we supposed to remember? The first thing we're supposed to remember is God. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 10, is, is specific about that. It says, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God. I think that's pretty plain. Don't forget God failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees that I'm giving you this day. So we have a command to remember God. And you say, well, that's basic. Yes, it's basic. But do you understand how many problems that we're entertaining in our life today because we have not handled the basics of life? The only way that I can be mad at, at anybody is if I ignore God. 
I have to ignore God to be mad at Rocky. Because if God is in my face, he's going to be looking at me like, So many times, I'll face off with Rocky just so I can have Jesus to my back and just kind of keep. Huh? I have to ignore God. So if I'm remembering God, and I'm not just remembering the fact he's like, but I'm remembering the fact that he loved me, he forgives me constantly, he blesses me, he encourages me, he heals me, he delivers me, he sets me free, he gives me peace, he gives me joy, he he keeps my family together, he keeps money coming in, he keeps a roof over my head, he keeps his presence in my, when when I remember God, it's an easy thing for me to forgive Rocky. But when I forget him, it's amazing. Do you understand how short the memory span of Americans are? I thought for I thought for a long time this was just this was just happenstance. It's not. Listen, I'm of the generation that Looney Tunes was the deal. Porky Pig, Daffy Duck, come on, Bugs Bunny, Elmer Fudd. Their stories had a plot. It made sense. It didn't make sense how he could blow the and they live. <laughs> That part didn't make sense. But the story had a, had a plot. Now, at least last I knew, because I haven't watched cartoons in a long time, they have this thing called not Looney Tunes, but Tiny Tunes. And Tiny Tunes, the, the plot changes. It's so fast. And you're like, what just happened? That was, just, that was like 25 stories crammed into 30 seconds. I don't understand what any of it was. Why? Because as soon as something's happening, what do we do with babies when they start crying? Take out our keys. Jingle, 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 jingle. Right? Because it gets their attention. So what happens is something happens in our life, and there's an immediate distraction. And before we can embrace or deny that distraction, there's another one. And we find our whole day going from distraction to distraction to distraction to distraction to where we don't even remember what we started with. I'm going to try to be good. I'm going to walk the tightrope for just a second. Even in politics, we don't remember what they said. We don't remember the promise that they gave that was an out-and-out lie, that they didn't fulfill anything that they said they were going to do. So what do we do? We vote for them again. Why? Because we didn't remember they lied to us a lot. Y'all ain't hear anything I'm saying at all. And so we do that in relationships, too. Because we're so easily distracted, we don't remember. And what's happened is we're so programmed in this life to not remember what we ate, where we went, where we spent that money, how many's been looking at your checking account. Why is it so overdrawn? What's that? Oh, yeah. Well, where'd that come from? Oh, yeah. Because we don't even remember. Our problem is we do that with God. We don't remember that he forgave us and healed us and set us free. We don't remember that we have a covenant. I simply cannot fathom marrying my wife and waiting up, waking up that next morning and going, who are you? <laughs> and yet we come before Jesus, be the Lord and Savior of my life, and the next morning we don't remember we did it. Forget not his benefits. Remember the Lord your God. Why? Because we're being taught to forget everything. Second, we need to remember what God has done for us. The Bible says, who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of a hard rock. Can you imagine you being thirsty? And I come up here, we found out this stage, by the way, is concrete. We were going to cut it back until we stuck a camera in there and realized it's concrete. So all of a sudden, let's just say there's the electricity's out, everybody's starving, and and I take some stick, and I say, all right, guys, and I hit the stage, and out of this concrete comes fresh water. Would you remember that for a long time? 
How many's ever seen a miracle? I mean, a bona fide miracle, a healing, a, a deliverance, a what you see, you saw it with your own eyes. Isn't it amazing how quickly you can forget it? Some of you just know you have. You don't even remember an, an actual occasion, but you know somewhere in your memory banks there's one there, so you're going to raise your hand. You, but we struggle to remember. It's like we have a hard time accessing the parts of our mind and our memory that are positive. But it's instantaneous with something that's negative. Remember God. Remember what he's done for you. And then you got to remember what he told you to do. Deuteronomy 4.23, be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that, that he made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden. Don't forget your covenant. I don't know who invented sticky notes, but there, no doubt they're wealthy. How many times did you need to remember to bring a book, pay a bill, uh, an assignment? Uh, don't forget to get gas. And so what do you do? You write sticky note and you put it on the door. You know you're going to have to go out or you put it on your dresser, on the bathroom mirror, or whatever else. Why? To remind you. And now we went from sticky notes to our cell phones that know more about us than we know about ourselves. And so we tell it to remind us at a particular date at a particular time of an appointment or a, a lunch or a date or whatever else that we've got going on to remind us because we're prone to forget. I think we're prone to forget because we, we are no longer exercising our memory banks and so we depend on technology to remember for us or a sticky note to remember for us. What happens when the weather gets hot and the sticky becomes unsticky and it falls down and walks out of the bottom of your shoe? What is it that's going to make us not forget God? What is it that's going to make us not forget what he's done for us? What is it that's going to make us not forget what he told us to do? And what about the commitments that we've made to the Lord? Here's a weird verse. Genesis 31, verse 51. And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold this pillar which I have raised up between me and you, let this heap be witness and this pillar be witness that I will not pass over this heap against you and that you shall not pass over this heap and this pillar against me for harm. They were such at odds. I don't think Laban knew what else to do. So he made a heap of dirt and a pillar and said, Jacob, let these two things be a reminder that I'm never going to come and assault you and you're never going to come over here and assault me. Let this be the reminder. I, I, I just wonder, did Jacob just get drunk and then wake up the next morning and go, I'm going to go get Laban. And he walks out and he sees the heap in the pillar and goes, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> but it's a reminder. What reminders do we have in our life? What reminders do we have in our life? What do we want to remember? When we have baptisms, cameras are out everywhere. Baby dedications, cameras out everywhere. Building dedications, cameras. Why cameras? Memories. As our phones get smarter, we get a little dumber. And every now and again, I'll get a thing from Google that'll say, I've made you a video of some memories that were four years ago. I don't know about you, but I typically don't scroll four, five, six, seven years, right? So Google did it for me, and so it found an event, compiled a bunch of photos of that season or event or situation, and put it in a little video. How many, get, how many gets that yourself? And all of a sudden, I go, wow, I forgot we ever did that. I forgot about that restaurant. I forgot we went to that lake. I forgot about that. I forgot all about that. Isn't that great? But I was, I was reminded by what? A picture. Sometimes 
we need to look back at pictures that remind us who we were. Because sometimes who we were is better than who we are. But sometimes who we were is worse than who we are. So that picture can either convict my heart and say, I need to get back to how I used to be, or it can be a celebration that I used to be an addict. I used to be a mean person. I used to be belligerent. But look, look what God made out of that mess. <laughs> Memory is a powerful thing, but if it's hijacked, it can be a problem. Listen, I enjoy electronics when they work. But when they get a virus and it's been hijacked by somebody else, all the benefits went out the window. Remembering the promises of God should strengthen our faith on a daily basis. How many ever seen a rainbow outside? Two or three uh, youth meetings ago, it was, it was drizzling a little bit. And somebody said, hey, look at that rainbow. And as we looked to the east, there was this huge rainbow. And if you, if you followed it, you could just about see where it hit ground. And then a few minutes later, somebody said, look, it's a double rainbow. And there was one that went like this and another one that went like that. And I snapped a couple of photos. Why? To remember. But watch this. What is a rainbow a remembrance of? God's promise to us. He said, I'll never again flood the earth with water. That, this, is the, this is the covenant. This is the bow in the sky that represents a promise that I'm giving to you. So every time I see a rainbow, I'm reminded God did that to remind me that he never has broken his promise and he never will. Does that make sense? Why do I need to remember these things? First of all, it strengthens our faith. First Samuel 17, verse 32. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. This is talking about David and Goliath. He says, your servant will go and fight him. So Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're just a boy. And he's been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Do you see how David's memory assisted him in his present fight? We are like that one with the 50 dates. And God delivers us this day, and he delivers us the next day, and he delivers us the next day. All these days in a row, he delivers us from all of our mess. And then we wake up the next morning, we have no recollection. No memory. Because David had been through terrible issues and was successful and won because God enabled him, he had that to fall back on and say, if God will deliver me from the lion and the bear, he'll deliver me from this giant. Let's go. I wonder in our own lives how many fights that we've actually won. And if we're learning to fight our own fights or if we're running to other people who have pelts hanging on their wall and want them to go fight for us. What's the last battle you fought and won? What's the last devil you whipped? What's the last terrible circumstance that you went through and came out on the other side better for wear? I don't let just anybody pray for me. I 
because when I'm in a fight and I'm in the thick of it, I don't need a novice. I need somebody who's going to stand with me and fight with me. Because some well-meaning people may try to come help, and now I'm fighting the enemy, and I'm trying to protect them who thinks that they're trying to help me, so I'm fought on both fronts. Y'all don't hear anything yet. Huh? You ever tried to work on something and a little kid who wanted to help so bad got more in the way than they were a help, and you had to endure that to get the job done? <laughs> Y'all don't work on your own stuff anymore? Remembering facilitates worship. Not everybody can worship God from their heart because they have no memory of any walk or relationship with him. There's a song or two that if I were to play it for my wife, I believe it would stir up some positive feelings and emotions from our history. And I wonder, is there anything that can be played for you that will stir up the remembrance and the emotion and the, the love that you had for God when he saved you out of a big mess that you were in when you were crying out to him and you had no other place to go? Is there anything that can be played, anything that can be said, any memory that can be recollected that will bring back how you felt? The society today is weird. It's like they want to fast forward through all the dating. You might as well go to a coffee shop, meet somebody for the first time, and start off with a kiss right off the bat. I mean, that's just where society's at today. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying it's wrong. You've got no history with them. Kissing is a sign of affection and commitment and love. And if you're just throwing that around to people that you just met, then it winds up having no meaning. You catch what I'm saying? We have to learn how to dig deep and mean what we say and mean what we do. And I don't know that we have that capacity so much like we used to. Psalm 103, I'm wrapping it up. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my innermost being praise his holy name. Verse 2, praise the Lord, O my soul. He's talking to himself. Do you guys ever do that? Self, pay attention, I'm talking to you. David is imposing his will on his emotions. He's choosing to do what needs to be done. How many ever sang the song, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. How many ever sang that song? How many ever heard that song? Wow. We need to stop thanking God in general terms and start speaking of specifics. Have you ever tried to prove to somebody that you knew somebody that they knew? Oh, you're just saying, you don't know Billy Bob. Yes, I do know, but no, you don't. He's been my friend for 30 years, and I know we've never talked about you. Well, you don't know him. He likes to eat this. He likes to go here. He makes this amount of money. He works at this location. I met him here. I hang out with him there. When you start giving specifics, then they back up and go, well, now, wait a minute. Maybe you do know them. Right? You catch what I'm saying? And so we have a lot of people that want to come and sing the songs of love when they don't have a walk with him. They want to sing the love songs and, and experience the joy and the peace that everybody else gets, but they don't have that kind of relationship with him. You ever walked into a place with a friend or into a restaurant or something, you bump into a, a friend of yours, like a really good friend? Man, what's going on? You reach out, you're hugging them, you're loving them, you're slapping high fives and all this stuff, and your friend's sitting there going, I ain't doing that. I don't know them. Mm -mm. How you doing? How, how, how you doing? Right? Because they don't have that relationship. That's how a lot of people are when they come to church. 
You got some people just trying to embrace God, and you got other people saying, yeah, yeah, I'll, just, I'll be over here watching. Because they don't have history. We need history with God. What's the Bible say? Many will, will, will say in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these mighty, wonderful things in your name? And he'll say, depart from me. What? I never knew you. The inference is that you didn't know him either. There's a close relationship between forgetting God and forsaking God. Forgetting God and forsaking God. Jeremiah 18, verse 15 says, Yet my people have forgotten me. They burn incense to worthless idols, and they made them stumble in their ways and in the ancient paths. They made them walk in bypass and on the roads not built up. Their land will be laid waste, an object of lasting scorn. All who pass by will be appalled and will shake their heads. When we fail to remember God, when we fail to remember our commitment to him and his, his works in our life, we will eventually give ourselves over to the enemy. Remember Deuteronomy said, do not forget the Lord your God. So he's given us two ways, two faculties, if you will, to help with that. Number one is our memory, and the other one is imagination. Thank God for the memory that I remember when he saved my life and when he prevented accidents and th times I shouldn't even be here, that he preserved me. But I thank God also for an imagination that based on what he's already done, that's already impeccable and, and, and crazy, I now can use my imagination to, to wonder the, the plethora of ways that, that God will show up for me in the future. I wouldn't have the imagination if I didn't have the memory. Memories are the root system that feeds the fruit of imagination. It's hard, if not impossible, to imagine how God's going to get us out of a, a particular jam that we're in today if we don't have any memories of how he got us out of jams in times past. So how do we remember him? We practice being thankful. We rehearse being thankful. We also establish memorials to help us remember what God has done. When Rachel and I got married, we got married at 7200 South Walker, the building that burned. Both of our kids were dedicated there. I got rebaptized there. I had some great encounters with God there had relationships that were forged there. Countless hours in, in my office preparing messages and praying and having conversations. And so when I go to that slab, that's all that's left is a slab, and I can still see where the walls were. I can, in my mind, watch this, I can go in my memory banks and remember how tall the walls were, what the doors looked like, where my desk was positioned, what kind of carpet was there. Who used to walk by and talk to me in the office way and who, would, who I'd communicate with in the, in the sanctuary. When I walked down the sanctuary, what it looked like, where the pews were, where the arch were, uh, arches were, where the candles were. The classroom that the, 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 the people that I was uh, ministering to at the time, they redid the whole classroom, painted it, put texture on it, hung, hung uh, ceiling fans and, and put uh, crown molding all the way around, just, just dolled it up. And I can walk into that part of that slab and remember what was there. And my heart gets full again when I remember the wonderful things that took place there. My first encounter with deliverance and being out of control of my own body, I can take you to the piece on the slab of the concrete where that happened. So though the building is not there, that slab of concrete still is a memorial to me and a remembrance and reminder of encounters that I've had with God and his people. And I wonder, now that we've been here, you know we've been in this building almost three years. October 31st will be, will be three years in this building. And even now, as I drive by and as I come on an almost daily basis, when I drive by, my heart is full when I think of all the wonderful things that are happening in this building, that's happening in this room, that happens in the gymnasium, that's happening in the office, that's happening on the property. 
It's a constant reminder of where we came from and where we're at and how this is not the stopping place, but this is yet another stepping stone onto, onto greater and bigger things. But I'll always have an affection for this place. Why? Because God has met us here over and over and over and over again. All the many deliverance sessions that we've had where, where chairs were dumped over and all kinds of stuff happened as, as people were just crying out to God and coming to the front and weeping and, and how we've seen wall-to-wall people just slain in the power of God. Why? It's, it's, it's a memorial of, of the wonderful things that God has done in a place that we've dedicated for those things to take place. I don't just walk away from places that I've lived and been without having some sort of emotion that cements those memories in my life. In fact, for a long time, I had a hard time selling vehicles. I, I mean, I, I, I ran them until they died and then put another engine in them and ran it until that one died because I got too emotionally attached to a thing. We celebrate holidays because we don't want to forget people. Memorial Day, Valentine's Day, anniversary dates, Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Fourth of July. Hallmark cards made a, made a way in a, many of our lives. In fact, how many of you still today, when you get a card, you read it and flip it over to see if it's a Hallmark? How many still does that? Look at that. Look at that. Look, 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 look. Still look to see if it's a Hallmark. Why? Because it made an impact on our lives all those years ago that it, it, when you really mean something, you want to say something powerful, you, you give them a Hallmark. Even Passover feasts were a way to celebrate and remember things like the plague on Egypt and God's protection of Israel over their firstborn. We have to remember. Here's, here's something that I've noticed with the new generation of believers. I'm really sharing from my heart right here. A new generation of believers is is coming up that has not experienced the presence of God, the peace of God, the power of God, the anointing of God. They've not experienced deliverance. They probably really haven't really experienced even salvation. They were taught that if you prayed the prayer, all is well. And so you have people that are filling the house for an appropriate reason, but they don't have the history to keep them steady. So I want to do something for those of you that don't have memories of God ever doing something positive in your life. I wonder how many honest people we'd have in the room you just say, I'm searching my memory. I just remember God ever doing anything substantial for me. Can I just see your hand real quick? I'm not going to make fun of you. I'm not going to call you out. I just want to know. So we all have history. If you don't have history, I want you to borrow one of my memories. I want you to borrow one of mine. There's a, there's a bunch to choose from, but the one that, that keeps coming up in my own heart and mind is when I almost died in the hospital right up the street on 44th. And I remember telling the Lord, if you're done with me, I'm ready to go. But if you're not, I'll give you whatever the rest of my life looks like. The doctor had already come in and told me, if we don't find something, you're dead in about 24 hours. And then a family friend had a position they knew. And said, would you be open to second opinion? Yeah. So God sent a doctor through a relationship to another hospital to a patient they never met to save my life. So if you don't have a testimony of your own, 
then celebrate God for what he did for me. And that'll open a door provision for God to have access to do something in you. Does that make sense? In just a couple of moments, we're going to take communion. And, and some people have a, have a different mindset as to, as to how that goes, okay? We're, we're, not, we're not overly religious about this. This is an opportunity for us to remember that he chose to come. He chose to live and to set the example. He chose to die. His life was not taken from him. He gave it up. Then he went to hell for us so we wouldn't have to go. He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He rose again under his own power. He walked the earth for over a month visiting people that knew him in life. He gave instructions to the apostles, said, go to Jerusalem and wait until you be endued with power from on high. So they did. The Holy Ghost fell and empowered believers from that time till this. So when he says to remember the Lord's death till he comes, do you understand that every time we take that juice and that cracker, we are advertising to hell. You lost then, you lost now. Jesus is coming, and I'm not staying. Every time we do that, it is a declaration to hell. You lost again, and you lost again, and you lost again. It does to the devil what he's been doing with you with negative memories. Because Jesus coming back is a negative memory to hell. Does that make sense? So it's a proclamation, it's a declaration, and it's a love feast. Typically on wedding anniversaries, we, we try to go get something nice, a, a steak or red lobster or whatever, something above and beyond what we typically get, right? This may not be a, a ribeye steak and a glass of sweet tea. And though it's small, it's what we're remembering that matters. We're remembering the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. I normally read from 1 Corinthians 11. And in verse 27, it says, Whoever therefore eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of our Lord. Let me, just, let me give you my thoughts on that piece right there. We have in this country an awesome respect for the dead. Not many people would ever consider going to a funeral and blasting that person's reputation and defaming the people that love them. Even when going through the belongings of a deceased person, when you come across something that meant something to them in life, we, we typically hold that in, in revere and reverence and respect because it meant something to the departed. It's a sign of respect. And when Jesus was on the cross, he said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. They have no clue what they're doing. Jesus recognized that those who were participating in crucifying him didn't have the depth of understanding as to what they were involved in. Now, that's not quite true for us today. See, if we understand what Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection did for us, and now treat the honoring and remembering of his sacrifice with disrespect and dishonor with a flippant attitude, jeering and, and toasting the, the glass juices and seeing how fast and noisily we can crunch the crackers, that seems insignificant but it's not because of what and whom it represents we are not memorializing a dead man we're remembering the risen savior it's a song we used to sing when i was a kid god's not dead 
he's still alive. How many remembers that song? And I think sometimes we treat God as though he were dead. But he's not. How many of you have been forgiven of all your sin? Watch this. The only way that can happen is if you access the shed blood of Jesus and applied that to your life and body to wash you clean. It's the only way. If you can access the blood for forgiveness, shouldn't we also access the broken body for healing? Think about that. If I can say, Lord, I shouldn't have said that, and I shouldn't have done that, and I shouldn't have been mean to them like that, please forgive me, and I access the blood of Jesus to wash me clean, and I know that works. We wouldn't have the shed blood without the broken body. So if we have the broken body that he was bruised for our iniquities, he was beaten, his body was broken down for our healing. So if I can access his blood today, shouldn't I also be able to access, it's the same faith, the same faith that I receive forgiveness is the same faith that I access healing. Now watch this. Faith without works is? Okay. So just taking communion is an act of faith. So when you do, say, well, I just don't know what to do. Any different than what I've already done it. Father, I thank you today, Lord, for your shed blood. And as I ingest that, I thank you. I'm being washed fresh and new again of all my sin. And Lord, I take this, this broken body and I celebrate it as an act of faith as I'm ingesting this. Not only am I notifying hell that you're on your way back, but I'm also receiving everything that you paid for with your broken body in the form of healing, wholeness, wellness, and life. It's an act of faith. I've not witnessed it live myself, but I've heard of people that as they took communion, they received their healing because it was an act of faith. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah. Let's check it. I'm going to go ahead and pray for those that are online right now, and then we're going to take communion because I'm going to play a song, and YouTube likes to shut us down for playing music. So for those of you that caught any part of this message, I pray that you find yourself encouraged, stretched, challenged. We can't forget to remember. Remembering needs to be intentional. So for those of you that are struggling with negative emotions and bad things and wounds of the, of the distant, maybe even the not-so-distant past that prevents you from moving on with God, I want to pray for you right now. Lord, for every person who's watching who finds themselves crushed, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, in any way. I'm asking today that by your Holy Spirit, you minister to them right where they're at, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. God, that you do what I can't. I'm limited by time and space, but you certainly are not. So I'm asking you today, Lord, to heal, to mend, and to restore, and to give them a relationship with Jesus that they've never had before. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you're looking for a church home, we're looking to grow the family of God here at 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City, Sunday afternoons at 2 o'clock and Thursday evenings at 645 p.m. So until our next appointed time, God bless you and have an incredible day.